of those customer deals, has made four customer deals with our portfolio companies. And to give some more context, just one, uh, sorry, for every dollar we've invested, that's turning to $10 on average for our portfolio companies, showing that this market network that we've built really does support those portfolio companies that we've invested in. So looking for the top companies always before Series A, so pre-seed, seed, bridge rounds that are in or entering the North American market who can help with that network effect. All right, let's get into it. This particular subject, super exciting, lots of stuff happening. So let's just look at B2B well tech market. Market size is around uh, currently $90 trillion and expected to reach assets under management, $145 trillion by 2025. And this is going to have over 15,000 SEC registered investment advisors. Uh, if we look at the retail well tech market size, we've seen it grown from roughly 1.5 trillion in 2019, expected to hit 7 trillion by 2024. So a 32% annual compound and annual growth rate. And global high net worth individuals, wealth has increased over the last decade at a rate at about 7.7%. So lots of growth that's occurring in the space. If we look at the VC deal activity, we've seen that it's reached an all-time high. $3.2 billion has flown into the space, although in a shrinking deal count, showing that the rounds are actually getting bigger in size. Robinhood was one of the biggest uh, in the 2020 landscape, raising close to 40% of this total volume uh, with two different rounds, 600 million Series F, six and 668 million uh, Series G, the bulk going to other trading apps, but other ro other next generation robo advisory services can as well. Simple and scalable capital raising, another 140 million combined. Note this graph is just B2B wealth tech in generate. Uh, sorry, this graph does not include B2B wealth tech. That has generated another 800 million and roughly 80 deals, uh, nor the capital markets as well. I'm going to fly through a bunch of hot topics and we're going to cover some of this stuff on the panel. Super excited to hear what they say, but sustainability finance is on the rise right now, you know, 45 billion entering into sustainable funds. That was in Q1 2020. 50% of asset managers are trying to incorporate ESG sustainable practices into their existing funds. And you're actually on the other side, demand side, 80% of asset owners are demanding to, or, or, or say, in, plan to increase their impact investing allocations over the next three years. So heavy demand driving for this. Uh, there's some unique challenges that remain, like in, for, in a lack of common global standards, insufficient data, and unclear metrics. But nonetheless, we do think it's sort of at that inflection point that we're starting to see here. There's a huge demographic shift, and we're going to maybe talk about this as well with high net worth individuals. That there's 68 trillion that's going to get converted to uh, their hairs over the next 25 years. The great wealth transfer. And the younger generation is different, right? They're they're supposed like there's a significant eight point percentage gap between older and younger high net worth individuals when it comes to satisfaction and personalized offerings. And arguably, potentially 80% of those hairs will change financial advisors, right? So how we serve them will substantially change as well. You know, if we look at the CERB, another, another area of demographics to consider, and there's plenty to do here, is that 60% of the UK's wealth will be in women's hands by 2025. Comparing that with the fact that 72.5% of high net worth women in the UK believe men and women have very different investment styles. And then in some cases, the current way that they're being uh, assessed is insufficient. 36% of women investors in the UK feel patronized and their experience with asset managers and 25% wanted less jargon. So a lot of changes that are occurring and need to fix this for the, the investors in this case and the users and the customers in the story. All right. Omni-channel versus digital or and digital, shall I say, getting combined. One thing I want to stress here is first and foremost, it is about the process of handling those consumers. 97, 97%, so a huge number of consumers believe a smooth and simplified customer experience is essential when choosing a bank. This is more important than the actual medium itself. So yes, do the omni-channel approach to attract more customers, but make sure that your process is right in those channels. And we're just seeing a surge of digital. 44% of banking customers said they're using um, their, their primary bank's mobile app more often. Uh, so, so a lot of big pickup in terms of mobile usage. Hyper-personalization is all the talk right now. Most wealth managers are all in on technology. Only one third, or, or there, sorry, more than one third believe they have not been able to provide hyper-personalized services. So there's a lot of challenges that are hindering their ability to get to hyper-personalizations. You know, some of that has to do 
with uh, learning how to transform and, and provide services and tools to better empower their advisors, but also better enable their clients and the shifting regulations that have also caused them to focus in those areas as well. Uh, the other side is also behavior analytics, emotional analytics that we're seeing, sentiment analysis. So gathering sentiment analysis during trades to better support and, and reveal biases to support the traders in this story or, or help them with their emotions during the conversation. So to better offer services that reflect it during that time. And what we're seeing though is 56% of high net worth individuals. This is super important because the, you know, these wealth managers are, are not satisfied because they usually lack, the advisors they work with lack emotional intelligence or the ability to offer value added services or even FaceTime. So if we go into APIs and AI, uh, a lot of different things happening. 70% of market leaders are using alternative data to boost their performance. So that's rel relatively well known. That said, if we look at wealth managers, you know, while it's well known to use AI, 36% struggle to capitalize on the technology. So there's still a huge gap of actually adopting this technology and using it appropriate, appropriately. Uh, and 42% of respondents anticipate an increase of investment into AI technology in the firm next year. So regardless if there's a gap, they're going to continue moving forward because it's also at the other side, they've seen that 11% that if you can use predictive analytics, on average, you can receive an 11% increase in the number of customers in the past 12 months. Another concept that's interesting is this idea of platform as a service, especially more on the capital markets front. To give you an example, the keyword here is open, and we've actually seen, for, as an example, Wealthblock, a technology for which other uh, our portfolio companies, for which uh, registered investment advisors will use this technology as it gives them roughly 80% of the core features that they need and then build their own systems off of this existing platform. Uh, better segmentation, we are going to get into this and we're, we're going to talk, so I don't want to cover too much, but this is about serving different communities or different niche markets, but I mean niche that they actually represent a very large population, so it's just better offering better tailored products and, and, and a journey, a customer journey that's better suited to them, but we're going to hear from our panel and we're going to hear from Manuel Pitch later, so I'll hop over this. Uh, lots of stuff around democratizing funding, you know, from regulatory side of things, you see the Jobs Act increasing 5 million, we see SPACs like that are all the rage right now, helping companies go pre IPOs, I mean, they were the rage before they've come back with resurgence. And then yes, STO securitized token offerings, we'll cover more of that in the digital assets as aspect, but different ways of, of, of accessing funding right now. And technology is just two to kind of consider right now. If we look at the, the cloud side of things, most people would agree like, yes, cloud is key for them and will increase their usage and spending, you know, anywhere from 60% of, of users actually agreeing here. Um, now it used to be more about trying to shift on there pr predominantly for uh, cost reduction, modernizing technology um, uh, stack and, and virtualization of the workforce. But as we think the real promise in the cloud enables more modular systems, reimagine business models, foster agility, drive innovation, transform customer experience, more like you see with the, how the big techs are using it already. So very excited what that brings. And of course, we could talk about blockchain. I think this is one of the core areas that it, that it would be getting the best adoption. Actually, a recent research study from uh, Thought Lab, Rubini Thought Lab found that 225 out of 500 wealth management surveyed had incorporated the technology in some way. This could be allowing transactions to be verified electronically over established network of computers. All right, let's get into it. We're not here to hear, hear me uh, go on and on. So first and foremost, Steve Abrams has been in capital finance for over 30 years. He started at Scotia Capital, then shifting to BDC. He's a partner level wearing multiple hats uh, right now at the uh, supporting the or leading, sorry, the IT venture fund and a key advisor to me over the years. Get him to turn his camera on. Uh, Theodore Lau international thought leader in the space as an author and speaker with over 20 years of experience across various tech roles, including product, project management, operations, innovation, and now founder of Unconventional Ventures. And lastly, Jason Best, all the way on the West Coast, nice and early for him to join us over 20 years journey initially as in med tech startup executive turned investor through co-founding crowdfunding capital advisors to now managing partner and co-founder of Vector FinTech Partners. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm going to dive right into. I'll get each of you to turn your cameras on, Teo and Jason as well. And I'm going to just jump into the first question. Uh, Steve, lots of great stuff happening on the Canadian sector right now. Uh, you got a bird's eye view as you've been seeing it also from the from the early days to where we are now. Uh, can you, you know, from coast to coast, from robo advisory, trading, neo banks, SPACs, lots of fun stuff. Can you just share some of the stuff that you're seeing right now? Sure, Jan, and uh, great to be here with everybody uh, this morning on an amazing morning from Montreal. I'm going to start off with uh, 
the SPAC uh, world because Sonder, uh, one of our early portfolio companies, I was on the board when it was uh, just flat book, uh, just in Montreal, uh, just announced a $2.2 billion uh, SPAC uh, listing uh, coming probably uh, at the end of the summer. So very exciting uh, news uh, for Montreal. Um, so I'm a partner in the IT fund, but I'm also a partner in our uh, seed fund and the active fund that we're investing now is a woman in tech fund. And so we invest all across Canada. Um, the fintech landscape, uh, I think, you know, just around different exciting deals, we had actually our first exit in the woman in tech fund, um, which was a company called Beanworks, which was accounts payable software. And they, um, they were sold uh, just maybe a month ago uh, to a French uh, company for over 100 million. Um, early days of fintech, uh, we were an investor in Wave Accounting, which was you know, free accounting software. And um, they made their money through payment processing, payroll, stuff like that. And that was an exit that we had. Uh, it was over 500 million uh, to H&R Block. So we've been inactive through the IT fund, uh, through the Women in Tech Fund, uh, in lots of different companies across the board. Um, you know, one, one interesting story, story about the, sort of the wealth management and apps uh, is a Montreal, another Montreal story. Uh, which initially started out uh, at the first accelerator uh, with First Capital um, on a company called Milo. Um, they, you know, built up, you know, sort of the acorn of Canada, although they're actually now in France as well. And uh, they were able to, to, you know, grow and scale, raise money with uh, National Bank and Desjardins. Uh, and this were recently acquired, uh, you know, they changed the name to Mocha. Uh, and then were recently acquired by um, Movo. So exciting, uh, you know, one of the ones I missed, unfortunately, but... Uh, <laughs> Can't get them all, obviously. Um, so uh, sort of the big picture overview, we invest all across Canada and I'm a part of a, a couple of different teams and, and, and partnerships. Awesome. Thanks for that. That's a great, it's just great to see also on the Canadian front. We asked for a long time, when are we going to start seeing some unicorns? And there's been a really big surge, like even this was like two, three years ago by uh, stating and then all of a sudden it's kind of really shifted. And I think it's really tra- attracted some international attention. One more follow-up question. I mean, BDC is also you know, a big bank and, and it adopts innovation uh, practices yourself. And I'm always big on hearing about open innovation. So can you speak about different ways that uh, you've seen this occurred or, or, or technologies you've adopted? So you know, we're a crown corporation, uh, but we're Canada's small business bank. We have 65,000 customers across the country. Um, you know, we've been, uh, you know, having our account managers uh, using apps and stuff like that. But obviously the pandemic and closing everybody's office really put that in the forefront. And then we did a lot of stuff around um, COVID for both on the venture capital side, but also on the uh, lending side, and we had to react because all of a sudden everybody was applying for a loan online. And for us, we, you know, it was very, very like crazy uh, a year ago, basically, uh, trying to manage all these online requests. And so um, we've been working on it uh, over the last while. You know, it was always a, a all hands, every analyst, every associate was answering queries from people uh, to make sure we worked through the the backlog of requests. Um, one of the things that's interesting, I think, uh, we just launched uh, an app for our customers um, and so that they can now, you know, watch their finances. Um, but I think the bigger phenomenon uh, is something like a Brex, where in the U.S., um, Brex, which I think is, you know, multiple billion dollar valuation these days, really targeted small businesses, tech companies, and allowed them to do banking in a mobile app the Neo Bank, but focus very much on um, a credit card and a bank account that is for small business and with all different kinds of startups and stuff like that. And I think that, you know, as we think about, you know, becoming more and more of a fintech uh, and our innovation uh, at BDC, I think those are the kinds of things that we're, you know, going to continue to work on. Interesting. A lot of cool stuff there. Uh, let's shift it over to Dora. Really great to have you be here uh, as well. You, we spoke early on the, on another call, prep call, for those who don't know. Uh, you're very, very interested in the rise of the varying communities being segmented. I didn't cover enough in my my presentation because I wanted to open up to, to, to you to kind of expand on this. I know you're really very interested in it. So can you elaborate on this trend and some of the stuff you're seeing? Yes. Thank you so much for having me this morning, Jen. And um, 
It is it is one key um, trend that we've been following and observing, and we actually like it so much we wrote a book about it. Um, it's called Beyond Good, and it's out um, since last month. So as we think about and you and you use the word niche with with the quotes, and and I and I had to laugh because it is there's nothing niche about a lot of these new trends in, in communities. And as a matter of fact, a lot of them has been existing for a long time. It's just that from a financial services perspective, we choose to not pay attention to it, right? So for example, we're thinking about gig economy workers. This is the quote unquote future of work, but if we take a step back, contingent workers, contractors, they've existed for a very long time. It's just that we had not been able to meet their needs. And so we're excited about startups such as Stuvo, which not only help gig workers manage their tax and everything else, but also help gig workers maximize income looking for new gigs better paying gig jobs, because that's one of the biggest challenge that we see as more people move into contingency work, they might not be making as much as they used to. So how do you balance that out on the income side? That, that's really interesting. We're seeing trends um, addressing LGBTQ communities, so such as Daylight um, that just launched earlier this year. And a lot of times when we think about these segment markets and, and Billy Simons, uh, she's the co-founder of daylight, she said it really right. These are not niche. There are 30 million people in the United States that are in the LGBTQ. And on top of it, these are not really marketing segment per se, because these are communities with very, very unique needs. They face things that we take for granted, right? Such as buying a home, starting a family, making sure that we are secure long-term. These are a lot of things that we just take for granted as we progress through life, but not all the same opportunities are accessible to them. And of course, you know, I, I, I have to mention, um, I think the past two weeks, we have seen funding rounds um, that went into kids focused FinTech, Greenlight and STEP, um, enormous uh, amount of money going into the same market segment and for people that do not have an income. so. Uh, more to be seen on that, because if you look at how they structure the business models and what they're offering, um, I, I, I have to ask, it's an interesting segment, but how are they going to be able to survive, right? And then, of course, you know, for the last year, we're seeing more fintech focusing on communities of color. We have Cheese that focus on immigrants, Asian Americans specifically. We have First Boulevard that focus on Black America, Greenwood um, on Black and Latinx. So these are all really interesting um, startups that are popping up and I congratulate them on the, on, on the funding round. But if you take a step back, look at all the social movement that we have had in the past 12, 18 months, you look at all of the corporates that are coming out and saying, oh, you know, we're going to put in money and support all of these fintechs. These are still breadcrumbs though if you ask me, compared to all the large mega rounds that we have. So, you know, I would love to see more, but I would love to see bigger checks. Um, and then some of the lesser mentioned ones are, for example, Purple, that addresses people um, from families with special need children. That's an interesting one um, that focuses on uh, education, financial literacy, and helping them uh, become more independent uh, going forward. There's also a FinTech called um, Stretch Money, focusing on those that are leaving prison. So a lot of these different areas that banks are not really addressing that fintechs are stepping up to see. Now there are two, um, one big miss though, and Jen, you probably would know what I'm gonna talk about is, I would love to see more focus on longevity. In the very beginning of your presentation, you talked about changing demographic trends, right? And that's the one thing um, that I look at. I've been looking at it for quite a while now. And we think about older adults, we tend to gravitate, gravitate towards annuity, we gravitate towards retirement, but it's way bigger than that. As we have lived an extra 30 years since the beginning of 1900s, I don't know about you guys, I know I'm not looking forward to working an extra 30 years. So what does that mean to how I live and how I work and how I plan? How do I make that nest last much longer? And in addition to that, when we're seeing more generations living alongside each other, how do we then plan for a more complex financial life? I don't think banks are addressing that. I don't think fintechs are addressing it because I've had so many people that come and tell me that they're not interested in old people. Um, I have to break it to them though. There are more people that are older than um, 65 than there are people under five. So let's see. 
and a, and a huge amount of wealth to be transferred at that. So a very interesting time for sure. Maybe just a, another piece. I know you're also interested in big, so you've covered a lot of, that's a lot of scope. One last one, um, just if we're relatively quickly, uh, if you can be on the sustainability aspect and what areas are you most excited? Like, are we seeing the inflection point? There's been a lot of talk around sustainability for many years. Do we see, do we see this time where it's like, this is real, uh, it's starting to happen and we're shifting into it. I mean, we're seeing the metrics that say, so what are your thoughts? I, I think you hit it right on the head and in the very beginning is we don't have a common standard to measure, right? I, I think that's one of the biggest challenge. And also, unfortunately, it becomes a political thing, right? As much as we know we share one planet, we share one earth, and we need to make sure we don't ruin it, which we're doing a really good job at it, it becomes political. And so every time when you add all of these different um shall we say, diverse opinions, it makes it really hard. Um, we love, uh, for example, uh, what Ali Group uh, is doing in, in China with, with Ant Forest. I think it's, it's amazing to give them a way to offset the impact. Um, we love Aspiration, obviously, US-based. Um, that's helping consumers better understand the footprint. I would love to see more, right? I would love to see more of, for example, what MasterCard has been saying that they're going to step up. Um, I would love to see more accountability and I would love to have consumers better understand what we're doing. Cause right now I don't know what my footprint is. Mm. Awesome. Very, 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 very interesting. And a lot of new challenges, but opportunities for startups to cover Jason, we'll flip it to you. I guess we get, we gave you last in the story just to make sure that the coffee has sunk in this morning <laughs> Do appreciate it. it's 5 45 AM, but I guess uh, the hustle never sleeps and appreciate making that time. Uh, can you speak, maybe we spoke about uh, the different uh, verticals, uh, you know, companies interest, but I mentioned the technology layer, the infrastructure layer, how the shift is matched with different regulatory changes is enabling, you know, perhaps greater ability to create new products and services. What's your perspectives there? I mean, that's, you know, we, we spend a lot of time on the B2B and B2B2C areas, uh, really looking at infrastructure and private capital markets and deep tech for fintech. And so at the infrastructure layer, there really is this intersection between infrastructure and regulation. Uh, and so it's it, what we've seen, over the, the shift that I've seen since we passed the Jobs Act in 2012 is really that, you know, prior to 2012, uh, most regulators looked at fintech as the barbarians at the gate, people that were going to destroy the financial system through things they didn't understand. What really happened in that shift over the last few years is regulators have begun to understand that, that what the things that they want most, which are innovation, job creation, entrepreneurship in their countries, this is the, the way to unlock that is access to capital. And the way to unlock that is through financial services, regulation, reform, and, and expansion. And the ability to create tools that, that enable regulators to understand fintech and to utilize it for their own, for their own purposes. And so certainly what we've seen is um, the, the, the things that, that, that Stephen and Theodora have talked about really are uh, really all enabled through this infrastructure layer that, that's coming in at the, the banking layer and the regulatory layer to enable that innovation to occur. Uh, it's definitely a number of a number of executions we can talk about on top of that, but certainly the ability to for personalization, the ability for more transparency, the ability of real time monitoring, uh, the ability for uh, transactions to occur in real time versus you know T plus two. These are all really important opportunities. Awesome. Uh, and maybe just uh, following up on that, um, there's a lot of shifting on the capital market side of things. There's a lot of act action around democratization of funding. I, I touched it kind of pretty high level. Uh, do you want to elaborate on all the different funding mechanisms that we're seeing access for founders for them to be able to raise their financing rounds? Sure. I mean, I think that it's, it's, a, pretty, uh, it, it's, it's a pretty interesting time. And we've already heard from uh, the, the great news from Steven this morning about, uh, about SPACs and how they can impact companies. But Really, the things that I'm seeing are we're seeing a merging of public and private markets. Uh, we're seeing, you know, IPOs are becoming more difficult. And so we've, we've opened up SPAC. SPAC has been around for a very long time, for 20 years. It's just they've become more popular and more used in the last couple of years. Uh, and so, you know, that that's opening up. We're also seeing the fact that now organizations like Robinhood and uh, SoFi are going to be offering public uh, pre-IPO shares to their clients. Uh, now you're seeing the rise of Regulation A plus and crowdfunding in the United States and other countries around the world. Uh, and so this, this opportunity, as you alluded to, the fact that now regulation crowdfunding in the United States have gone from 1 million uh, you can raise per year to now 5 million, so you can raise a proper seed round uh, via crowdfunding. And Regulation A plus is a more of a growth stage opportunity. You can now raise up to $75 million uh, from, a, from both accredited and unaccredited investors in the same vehicle. 
And so we, you know, this opening up of the, of, of the markets, the merging of public and private, is just creating a lot more funding opportunities and a more competitive landscape for VCs. Awesome. Now it's super exciting time. I'm hoping that uh, on the Canada front, we're going to pay attention to some of the crowdfunding rules and bring it up here and get better harmonization and increase those limits to support those the, our founders from doing so. Speaking of those who've used crowdfunding before, by the way, one of our portfolio companies, Manzel, so maybe this is a good opportunity, has gone through this. Uh, I'll invite him onto the stage and we'll get him to share his screen at this point. Great to see you, Mohammed. Uh, in this, as, as he's setting up, maybe uh, I'll get Sam, your backend operator there. Can you maybe launch our first poll just so we get a little our audience participation? I want to hear what they are thinking right now in terms of what they see are as, as the, the key trends. So Sam will launch that poll to all panelists and audience. Feel free to fill that in. And that's perfect timing because Manzel is shared and ready to go. Take it away, Mohammed. Thanks very much, Jen. And uh, really appreciate being uh, uh, you know, on this uh, with the esteemed panel. Uh, my name is Mohammed Sawaf for everyone, uh, co-founder and CEO of Menzel. We're the ac actually only Islamic fintech here in Canada. Um, if you didn't know, there are about 1 million uh, financially excluded Canadians, and there are about 5 million Canadians that are completely underbanked. And within that subset of population are the Muslim uh, Canadians, because they are financially excluding themselves due to a lack of product that don't align with their religious beliefs and, and systems. And so when we look at the actual Canadian Muslim population, it's set to grow and, and double over the next 10 years and not only making it the fastest growing demographic, but the second largest religious base after Catholicism, very strong spending power with $20 billion annually, uh, very high education rates, but lowest participation rates of home ownership and capital markets. And that's not due to their balance sheets. It's due to a lack of product. So this is where Menzel actually... Uh, fulfills the gap. We are not only a product manufacturer when it comes to halal certified financial solutions, we are actually also a distributor uh, direct and we also distribute through our financial partners. Um, the Islamic finance space globally has been growing at double digit CAGR. It's $2.5 trillion business right now. And there are currently 93 Islamic fintechs globally of which Menzel is one of them. When we entered the, uh, the Holt Fintech Accelerator program right after we raised our pre-seed round, we were able to accelerate, um, obviously, our product launch, our partnerships, um, and we've been able to get into other accelerator programs as well as um, uh, launch additional products um, and win uh, multiple awards. Um, you know, as of late, uh, we, we, are, we have become the first Canadian associate member of AOP, which is the Accounting and Auditing Organization for Islamic Institutions, which is a universal regulatory body based out of Bahrain, where all Islamic banks um, are, are members of. Um, so this was a major feat. And, uh, and this year, we're actually moving forward into, um, you know, Canada-wide expansion for our Halal Homes residential product. Uh, we're building kind of the foundations of what we want to see in the future as this digital Islamic neobank. Um, we're currently in talks to acquire another Halal fintech that will supplement our product shelf and, and basically take care of our clients from cradle to grave, as they, as they say. Um, and we have a bunch of other uh, products uh, that were lined up as well. So, you know, we've, we're, we're really in growth and scale mode right now. And, uh, you know, we, we can't help but thank uh, Holt for, for accelerating uh, that for us and uh, happy to take any questions at this point. Too kind, Mohammed, but you did it all yourself. Just happy to be part of the journey there. Uh, let's slip, open it to the panelists. Ideally, feel free to add a comment from what you see, what's uh, just your perspective overall, and as well as in a question. Try to keep to 30 seconds. Mohammed, try to keep answers to about a minute just so that we can get as many questions as possible. Will do. Mohammed, this is Jason. Uh, I, Jason Best, I've... Um, it's great to see the, this product in Canada. I've done some work in the, in the uh, GCC countries and MENA countries on, on Islamic finance. Huge market, huge opportunity. Uh, what are the, I um, uh, was wondering what, if you've seen things in the buy now pay later space, certainly taking off uh, 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 very significantly in the GCC countries uh, with some, some great recent rounds announced in the UAE and, and Saudi. I was curious what, what sort of buy now pay later strategy or how you're thinking about that space uh, in Canada. Yeah, no, absolutely. As you mentioned, uh, there, there have been a, a couple of big rounds as of late, uh, I, I believe in Saudi and the UAE specifically. Uh, you know, buy now, pay later is, is, is a huge market uh, that, that can be uh, basically taken. Uh, you know, there's an opportunity here. 
Because when you think about the mindset of a typical Muslim, everything is based on a, on cash basis, right? Like nothing is done on debt. They're very debt averse. They're very risk averse individuals. Uh, and so buy now, pay later, if it's constructed in a Sharia compliant manner, uh, you know, can fulfill a gap of, of basically extending that cash flow or allowing, you know, these individuals and households uh, to, to create a budget around that. So, you know, we're definitely thinking about that more as a long term strategy. Of course, there's there's multiple uh, products that we need to have in place before we can start to move into that sphere. But it's definitely a huge opportunity, I would say, here in North America as well. Great, thank you. Um, in the in the mortgage space, uh, you know, there's all kinds of different things that play in, and then in adding sort of different pieces of the real estate transactions. What about um, adding areas around like the Redfin and Zillow's and sort of the um, the broker, the real estate agent? Like, have you thought about sort of extending um, the yeah. services? It's a great, it's a great question, Stephen. So on the on the mortgage brokerage side, we're completely, uh, let's call it in house vertically integrated. So a lot of brokers come to us and say, hey, I have clients and we're just like, listen, we're D to C, you know, they're coming to us anyways. But on the on the real realtor side, uh, you know, actually, we are launching that very soon. Uh, we've already put put it in place. So you know, cats out of the bag. Uh, but you know, now it's now. <laughs> yeah having control of the client experience right from the day they decide to make that purchase, knowing that funding is available, that is, uh, you know, aligned with the religious beliefs, uh, makes it just a better experience overall. So, you know, watch out uh, for that Menzel Realty uh, product. Well, there's a, I guess no, Noble out. in Toronto, right, is, uh, has been actively doing this as well, right? They've created this real estate agent online and, and uh, yeah. adding to the, the, the customer journey. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I would even further extend it to say that you could potentially create an MLS version for this community where they could buy and sell homes between each other because some people want to get into uh, a home, you know, that, uh, you know, is available on the marketplace that has Sharia compliant. Fine. It's just easier to transfer between sure, each sure. other. So, you know, th there's a marketplace to be had there. And, and that could be something, uh, you know, of a long term vision that Menzel could create as well. That's great. Like tail, you we on, We just need you on mute there. Oh, this is so 2020. Jeez, <laughs> nice. Um, I need my third cup of coffee. So, Mohammed, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Super psyched. Um, it is a very, very underserved market. Um, shall we say? I'm glad you're the first one there. Um, I'm curious to see how you will see this play out with the more traditional Canadian banks. Obviously. They had not stepped up, right, <clears throat> to provide sure compliant mortgages. Do you see that changing? And how would your relationship be as they start getting more into the sector? Yeah, so I, I actually have uh, no, um, like, I don't think they're going to do it at all. Like, there have been attempts in the past. Um, I've had multiple conversations with high-level executives with respect to kind of how the product works. I think it's just too big of an ask or, or a task for them to, to do. And at the end of the day, you know, they're playing in a trillion dollar marketplace while we're playing in a billion dollar marketplace. Uh, you know, it's 150 billion in terms of the TAM, but I guess that's just not big enough for them to move the needle. And, you know, we also need to understand that there's a lack of experts uh, in, in, in this sphere. Um, there's a lack of uh, individuals that know how to create these products that, that appeal to all of the regulatory guidelines. I would say we've had lower barriers to entries on this front just because we act more as a private lender versus a Schedule 1 bank where there's additional regulation and compliance with respect to kind of how that box works. Um, and so, you know, I, I highly doubt, you know, I, I, you know, we've been in the marketplace now technically for four years and they've been watching us and they haven't made a move. So I, I don't think there will be any competition. It may be very extreme for me to say, but, you know, if they were to come into the marketplace, I, I or think about it, I, I would say that we'd probably be kind of a target acquisition first before they would even start to look at trying to create something on their own. Thank you. Well, it's their loss because it's a good market to be had. And we've seen um, organizations out in Southeast Asia where they appeal not just to the Muslim population, but wider demographics of people just because, you know, the purpose and everything else works um, for, for a wider group. 
a hundred percent on the ethical front. Like I, you know, if you learn more about the Menzel product and solution, we have the only 25 year fixed and variable rate mortgage products available in Canada. Can't be found anywhere else because the whole country revolves around a five year renewable, right? So very common in the U S as you may know, but uh, so that's where on the ethical front on, on the more participatory, you know, financing front, we can appeal to the greater community outside of the, the Canadian Muslims. But right now our target is the community Muslims because it's the low hanging fruit. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mohammed. We'll have to cut it there. Wish we had, could continue with you, but I uh, do appreciate taking the time. So thank you. We'll have you to drop off right now. I'm going to try to wrap up this panel, go back to some of the poll results that we actually saw. We had the big winner on, on the trend there, sustainable finance, 43%. So most of the audience thought that was the interesting area. Demographic shift, uh, 18%. Hyper-personalization, 18%. Better segmentation. Uh, maybe just quickly to the, uh, I'm going to launch one more poll around technology so everyone can participate as we do. Rapid fire to, to our panelists. Which area did you vote for and why? Just a one-liner because we're, we're getting tight on time. Anyone want to go first? AI. <laughs> DeFi in blockchain. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's all be our next segment. <laughs> oh, that's what's so you're, you're allowed to do it. Say what you want. <laughs> Steve. Uh, definitely crypto. All right. So, well, that is a fantastic way to transition to the panel. So thank, that was unplanned for, but I do appreciate you guys teeing that up accordingly. I'd like to thank uh, Steve, T uh, Teo and uh, Jason for your awesome perspectives. Really appreciate you guys all taking the time to advance thought leadership here and have some good fun conversation, early morning coffee chat. So thank you. I'll get you guys cut the mics that point uh, and uh, log off as I shift uh, to, I'm gonna share my screen. So apologies while I talk as I do the actions. Let's get into it. So we're gonna shift to the next one. I don't wanna waste any time here. Crypto world is just, just crazy right now. A little bit on fire, shall we say. 2013 was the market caps of 10 billion bucks. Now we're seeing closer to 2 trillion. I mean, by the time this thing was printed, obviously it's already outdated. So we're seeing 8,300 coins in the market. Um, obviously the major caps going to Bitcoin and then the next big five coins. 290 exchanges, top 10 trading around $27 billion. Uh, on the VC side of things, oh, sorry, there we go. Venture capital side of things. Not as much venture capital as you would have thought, but probably also because of the fact that the ICOs took up and STOs took up a portion. So we have seen a rebound in 2020 at this time. Some mega deals that went through last year, 300 million by uh, backed, uh, 200 million by Ripple, 142 million by Paxos, several companies in the uh, $50 million range, but there's a whole slew of other smaller ones that are still early stages in the DeFi space, which we just heard from Jason alluded to before as well. Uh, so I'm going to fly through a bunch of this stuff. It's hard to cover this world uh, so quickly and it's a trends, but there's a lot of stuff. Let's just talk about the idea of regulations on this front. Let's just give an example like Canada. So there's a bit of a crackdown starting to happen, right? So better taxation around that space, especially on the capital gains. You know, most recently, the story of CRA actually coming down on uh, uh, coin, uh, sorry, uh, coin square and actually requesting those who had over $20,000 of accounts, uh, that who had a, a value in their accounts dating back all the way to 2013. So this is like five to 10% of coin squares, uh, uh, total data and really imposing them to actually get a better assessment of that. So some shifting that's occurring, like a best idea as example would be looking at Switzerland, who's really like seen crypto made crypto, uh, exchanges legal in Switzerland. It's all under uh, FINMA and has actually, actually granted a couple, uh, two licenses to two financial institutions for cryptocurrency trading and, and custody activities. Uh, so if Finman now argues that I ICOs was before, right, can be regulated under the current financial security rules. However, the regulatory bodies has offered insights in the form of ICO guidelines. You know, in 2020, we also saw the Swiss residents uh, of uh, Canton of Zug were informed the ability to pay their taxes by Bitcoin. So upwards of uh, within Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies up to 100,000 uh, Swiss francs. Mining in cryptocurrency is allowed, uh, but there's not really, there's no other rules have been drafted yet other than of course the taxation issues going for the gains. 
Um, and there is, as we've seen, the Blockchain Act, which was announced this year, uh, Parliament, amend uh, Parliament amended laws passed uh, for really paving the way for distributed ledger technology. So this is just one country of many, so, but I thought it was an interesting case because they've really been quite advanced in, in the movement there. If you look at the cybersecurity, there's tons of hacks that are still occurring here. Most of it is shaking up in the DeFi space. Uh, over 45% of the thefts uh, in, in crypto actually occurring there. Things that are happening up to $50 million in, in, in hacks. You know, we've seen things in, in the cases like uh, KuCoin uh, in our October, 280 million. Fortunately, recovered 84% of the stolen crypto, but still a large amount. I mean, there's just operational failures, security breaches, and, and fraud that's still occurring. And it has to do with just finding reliable protection mechanisms, like things that we actually have in the traditional finance, the ability to uh, protect in this case, right, uh, from, from loss by the Securities Investor Protection Corporation, SIPC, or cash deposits being protected by FDIC. So while there are some features, I, you know, <laughs> that are being developed, and I think the key here is making sure that you have your, prop, your blockchain properly audited right now is the main protection mechanism. Uh, as we shift to big tech is moving into space, Elon Musk, Big story, right? Buying 1.5 billion in Bitcoin and, and, and accepting uh, uh, as a form of payment, PayPal, your ability to buy, sell crypto. So further increasing the adoption and movement of money. Stripe tried this back in 2018, uh, kind of scrapped it for the time being, at least for the time being. And then now we're look, waiting on the Facebook Libra slash DM expected to make its piloted debut later this year. A lot of things, if you heard about crypto for, for others, it's just really about NFTs. I mean, that's a, a form thereof. Crypto kitties were all the rage before, shifted to NBA top shots, right? $390 million of trading cards that we're seeing flying around. It's also applied to arts, gaming and collectibles. So, you know, gaming side of things, you know, average user, Fortnite user, $85 per, per payment. Or if you look at some of the artwork, we're talking 70 million was the, lar the, the largest sale. This was for Beeple's work. Uh, every day is the first 500 days. So on the venture, side investing into these type of companies 760 million recently going in has been raised through 134 deals the largest being closer to 300 million right now so the icos the stos there was a shift right so we saw this huge surge in icos way more money than anything that was actually not like factors of multiples larger than the venture capital space really peaking in uh, march of 2018 when 520 issuances and then dropping back to december when there's 117 issues but tons of scams obviously came out 90 percent of icos were considered to be scams there's just a lack of was lack of transparency uh around what is the pricing and, and how these are all getting built uh became a, and there was a lot of issues around pump and dump strategies or so artificially inflating the secondary markets to, to boost up the pricing sec and and uh and on europe as much start, started cracking down on this and really saying hey guys these are tokens here so what does it mean really kind of paved way to the sto world we're actually super bullish on this still in the early days you could be using this for to create a liquidity uh better supporting the secondary markets for vc funds but especially real estate we actually backed a company called solid block to support in a lot of fun uh, areas and I really see it interesting when you have multiple funds to create fungibility to it and there have been funds that have actually launched who are fully tokenized so interesting world as we go forward cbdc lots of action all around the world uh different areas from big moves from the us to uk and china most recently different types of models so it's either the retail side being the, the most probably the apparent one and, and the most kind of preferred around all nations globally uh, so retail payments between facilitating the retail payment side of network between individuals and businesses but also you have the wholesale side so that's more of the settlement between financial institutions that's more of what canada had been focusing on and canada was actually one of the earliest project uh, adapters project jasper at the time uh but sort of like took a back seat waiting for other leaders to emerge in this instead focusing on real-time payment networks but you know we do think that if we should something strongly consider 90 percent of members of the European Payment Councils believe blockchain technology will uh, fundamentally change the industry by 2025. All right, blockchain and finance, still lots of areas where we think it's the, the low hanging fruit to enter, you know, distributed ledger technology could allow more transactions to be settled directly. So whether or not it could be uh, supporting uh, better uh, existing protocols like SWIFT, moving securities on the blockchain could save arguably 17 to $24 billion in global trade processing costs. Uh, and especially true for trade financing when you're trying to enable trust between various uh, jurisdictions. But also KYC, and we actually seen this with a couple of portfolio companies, Matt.ai and Commercial Passport, leveraging this technology to bring down the cost of the banking sector, which is cost upwards of $160 million. So still some 
uh, earlier days, but not advancing uh, into uh, actual operational stuff here. And uh, we couldn't finish this without talking about DeFi. So as Jason said, hey, we got to look out for this. He was on our last panel if you just joined us. Uh, so we're talking about there's currently uh, in total 44 billion is locked into DeFi applications at this point. So decentralized finance, I mean, it's one of the biggest areas, DeFi lending. We're seeing some big players like Maker, Compound, and Aave. Uh, but there's other areas like uh, Stripe's DeFi equivalent uh, request. So providing a similar payment processing and gateways that are completely disconnected from the legacy payment rails. So we're, we're starting to see that, um, you know, they're probably likely to succeed in sort of a hybrid fashion potentially, uh, but very excited to see where this world goes. All right, let's enough from me because we're not here to hear me go on. We're here to hear about, for instance, our great panelists, starting with Ethan, Ethan Pierce, 20 years in the business, has been a professor at various universities, a successfully exited founder, a uh, and now founding partner for Borderless Ventures alongside a wealth of other startup blockchain and international experiences. We also have Scott McAndrew, experience, which is a 25 years experience trader in organizations like the TX, uh, TSX, Credit Suisse, Canada Trust, and uh, independently, and currently is president of Holtz. Uh, newest digital wealth management platform. And lastly, a a Emily Raffo, an entrepreneurial consultant from guest lecturing on blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and small contracts. Uh, now marketing sales part of Chain Security, which is just recently spin off of PWC Switzerland. So I'll invite you all at this point to open up those cameras and I will dive right into the first question for sake of time. Let's flip to Ethan all the way in uh, France. Ethan, okay, let's start with NFTs because I think that's all the rage right now. Talk me through the various reasons uh, that, that that's interesting from your perspective. But then maybe I know you're, like, you're just, you love the technology, but like the, it's the beautiful nature of it. And it's the fact you know, immutability and transparency and areas that you see most uh, that could get most traction. Yeah, so I think the, uh, can you hear me okay? You're good. Okay, so I, I think the interesting thing uh, when we look at the NFT space, so for the past couple of years, I've been uh, speaking a lot on tokenized security. So the, the other hat that I wear that's probably more contextual uh, to this is, is, is I founded uh, the Crypto Assets Institute, which advises governments, funds, and, and large corporates on issues around the blockchain economy. So I've been talking about tokenized securities for a while. And the example of, of, among real estate, intellectual property, um, startup uh, funding, all these different kinds of things. The one example that people were, could really get was collectibles in terms of tokenized securities. Well, NFTs are basically how we're enabling this tokenized security idea in the world of collectibles. We're gonna see NFTs all over the place in finance, but right now in art, uh, this is really the kind of the, the, the cool space. People get it, they understand Magic the Gathering cards, baseball cards, comic books. They understand that you know these things are collectible, that they're unique. So you know the fungibility thing, uh, for people who, who aren't used to having to use that word, but when we talk about assets that are fungible, things like uh, you know, one Ethereum is no different than another. An ounce of, of gold is no different than another ounce of gold of the same you know, qualities. And so that's one thing. But when we look at unique collectibles or unique assets, the non-fungible thing is what we're talking about. And so when we look at art, this is a fascinating space because uh, already it has been very difficult historically for artists to make um, um, money from their creation of art. But since the pandemic, uh, obviously no galleries, you know, a, a, a severe difficulty in, in accessing um, artists. We've also seen plenty of musicians and, and, and others who are also leveraging NFTs now. You know, it's been hard for them to make any kind of money uh, during the pandemic. Well, this thing comes along and really changes that for them with NFTs, especially around digital art, but other things. This is just a, a digital way to represent some kind of attachment or ownership or access to an art asset. It doesn't mean that you necessarily own the copyright or, or the intellectual property of this thing, but that, that's defined in the actual NFT itself. But here's where it gets really fun. Not only then can you sell your NFT uh, to whoever through one of these different platforms that are out there. But if we look at the $65 million sale of Beeple's uh, um, collage artwork that, that was done recently through Christie's, uh, the most interesting piece of that for me is not the $65 million, although that's just insane, um, and bravo for him. It's the fact that there's a 10% commission baked into the smart contract so that the next time the person who bought that sells it to someone else, he's not the only one to make money. 10% of the sales have to go back to Beeple. This kind of baking um, 
qualifications or, or other things into the NFT smart contract is super interesting for the artists themselves. If we look at this differently, if we look at something like So Rare, which is a fantasy football uh, soccer uh, platform that is doing digital collectibles with NFTs, uh, what you might be able to do, you know, once if you happen to buy that um, Ronaldo or, or Antoine Greitzman um, digital collectible inside of So Rare, you've got that NFT. Well, once we can actually go back to a full color, a full stadium for, to go watch a soccer match, uh, maybe if you're there uh, and you're watching um, Antoine Kreitzman uh, uh, play, but you've got his NFT, you get to sit in a special section of the audience, or you get to buy a, a special jersey, or you get to have a discount, or maybe you get to go to a, a VIP cocktail with him after the game. There's all kinds of things we can do to where we can bake in rights and access into the smart contract of the NFT. Uh, that's super interesting. Uh, and I think that we're going to see uh, artists, but also uh, really all kinds of different entrepreneurs that are going to come up with very creative ways to add extra value on top of the the intellectual property or the collectible um, for the owners, for the people who possess that NFT. And that's where this is going to get really, really kind of fun. Super interesting. And you know, in the artist space, I mean, it's amazing products, but sometimes very hard or... <laughs> challenging ways to monetize it. And here we're starting to see some very interesting solutions to solve for that gap and love all the different examples. Can we flip over? You're just a wealth of different areas to focus on here. I mean, CBDCs, regulations. Okay. I know those are two different, <laughs> but uh, what's your take on some of these like different nations or jurisdictions that we should be following right now and why? So on the central bank digital currency uh, conversation, you were uh, it was it was great that you mentioned that there are two kinds that there are retail CBDCs and there are interbank uh, or wholesale CBDCs. That's really important because certain countries are only do really looking at one or the other. And there's a few that have looked that are looking at both. Right now, there are over 60 central banks that are working on either a retail or an interbank CBDC. Um, the Bahamas have already launched theirs uh, last year, the Sand Dollar uh, CBDC. Uh, Cambodia has also their Bekong uh, project, which is actually um, uh, both a retail and an interbank, interbank project. Uh, China's Digital Yuan, which is the DCEP, the Digital Currency Electronic Payment. Uh, technically, that's still in trials, but it's done over $300 million in transactions. Uh, they haven't been very clear about when that might actually launch officially, but it is known that they want to roll it out for the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing. So I think there's a lot of, you know, in, in terms of countries wanting to get there, there are very interesting things going on. Uh, there's several retail CBDCs uh, in advanced stages of their trial process. You've got Ukraine, Uruguay, Ecuador, Sweden, South Korea, Turkey, uh, all kinds of good stuff going on in those places. Um, you know, it, it really depends what we're looking for there. It's still for me, remains to be seen how exactly people are going to leverage those day to day. What's that, what's that going to mean for them? Um, which governments are actually going to really take this seriously and, and get in there? But I do believe that when we look at digital currencies, when we look at global digital currencies, I think the thing that we need to understand is it's not just going to be sovereigns, so the central bank digital currencies. It's not going to just be the decentralized uh, currencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, and it, it, we're also going to have potentially these corporates or consortiums like we see DM, which is the new name for Libra. Um, we see other different organizations out there. It, it's going to be a mix of those. It's not just going to be one. And so where are we going to end up in the mix of what do we use and, and do people actually use it? I've personally, uh, as somebody who's extremely um, um, pro crypto, especially on the crypto assets side and not necessarily always on the cryptocurrency side. I don't think anybody's ever going to go spend 0.000001 uh, Bitcoin on, on a Starbucks latte. That the, the, It doesn't make sense in our head. It doesn't work that way. We need to work in units that we can grasp. But I do think we already have the, the habit, especially because of the pandemic and sense of taking out our phone and paying with a contactless app for everything that we do or doing e-commerce. And those habits have been pushed radically forward in the past year because people moving into not wanting to touch stuff, not wanting to use physical cash. And the thing is, is nobody, you know, 99% of the people out there are going to have no idea how that worked from tapping their phone to money coming out of their account to Starbucks getting the money. So does it matter if that's euros or dollars or Bitcoin or Ethereum or a CBDC or DM or I don't think it does. And I think we're going to get to a space where 
whether you're using TransferWise uh, to send money across borders or you're using uh, your card to buy for things or whatever it is that you happen to be doing, you are going to just transfer value from one place to another. And the people building those applications are going to use the system that is the most efficient, that is the fastest, that is the cheapest. And if that's a digital currency over fiat, okay. And if it's a decentralized or a corporate or a sovereign uh, digital currency over another, I think we're just going to see a mix of all these things based on what creates the most efficient and interesting um, uh, way to do that. So really exciting stuff moving forward. Uh, on the on the very quickly two sentences on the the regulatory side, I think we've done a lot of the work when it comes to most of the regulatory issues around can we do crypto assets? Uh, can we tokenize certain things? There's more stuff to be done there. But I think the next year or two, the real issue is going to be taxes. Um, now that everybody is playing in the crypto sandbox, uh, tax man's going to come looking for it. And, and we're going to see a lot more, uh, I think, movement in that space of, you know, is it capital gains? Is it VAT? Is it income tax? We're going to see, because uh, we already see that in different places, no capital gains in Singapore. You've got capital gains in France, but they decided not to apply it to crypto. Um, you know, you, it's, we're going to see lots of mixes uh, of, of versions of that. So. Well, cool. awesome. I mean, well, really like tons of opportunities, lots of uncertainty in where we're going, but I like how you said there is one, well, there's two certainties, death and taxes. So that's definitely kind of be coming to us. All right, let's shift over to Scott for sake of time here. Scott, uh, there's also questions, by the way, you can ask Q&A. So if you're in the audience, please do. Uh, we've seen some people doing it directly uh, to us. Uh, but Scott, I'm going to try to flavor in one of the questions from Pradeep into a, the, the question I wanted to have for you. So you're building your own product roadmaps. You're incorporating various blockchain and digital asset technologies. Can you talk me through how you're kind of stitching these together? What are these technologies? How does it come into what you're, what, what you're looking to build there? And with a question that was asked, can real estate also be tokenized and integrated into DeFi or what are the challenge into it? I know you've looked at other companies like Solid Block, for instance. So anyways, if you can do, do your best to show how to talk us through and, and incorporate that question. Sure. Thanks, Jen. Um, yeah, with Solid Block, uh, I'm an advisor for that firm as well. And we've um, used their technology. Um, they're also helping with uh, Naoris, which is one of the other um Holt Accelerator companies to do um, their token listing. Uh, what we've done at Holt is over the past few years is bring together all the different technologies and focused on um, the graduates that have come through the accelerator. Uh, so companies like Concilium Crypto that you'll uh, hear about in a few minutes on the trading side, uh, Solblock, as we mentioned, uh, for tokenizing the real estate. They did the uh, first tokenized real estate deal in the Aspen Hotel. Um, and we're using their platform as well to offer uh, any of the Holt Accelerator companies that come through that would like, um, you know, a tokenized offering. Uh, what we're also doing is providing the on-ramps um, and the off-ramps for a lot of the companies that come through and, and working them in the mix uh, using Mad AI, uh, which is one of the graduates for the digital identity. Uh, Naoris, obviously, they secure um, the whole Holt uh, platform, which... Um, Obviously, with the banking capability, credit, lending, um, NFTs, basically anything that's tradable, we can store. And I think that's um, one of the benefits that we provide as well is, um, you know, having all the, um, the groups able to work together. And through the accelerator as well with the 500 different advisors, you learn about the different protocols, um, speaking with people like Ethan and just, you know, knowing where their mind's going and sort of what, what we're looking at next. But a lot of it is in the background and it is with the different protocols and different layers and the technology. And that's what we've done is make it a lot easier so uh, people don't see. It's literally just, you know, tap your phone or log in. And it's one platform with uh, a bunch of different protocols and uh, storage and stuff as well. That's a great point. I mean, like at the end of the day, it's got to be simple for the consumer at this, right? Like we're still at that layer that it's still a little challenging and cumbersome for a lot of the stuff. So as you're building, I have to think through that. Can we then bring that up then? Like who are, if, if you're bringing this together to be able to provide access to a customer base, access to different uh, assets that weren't previously available to them in a more frictionless manner, who are, who are kind of you targeting right now as some of the key customers, right? And like, how are traditional investors portraying this? I, I still feel like there's a bit of 
two sides on it, right? Like some people will get close to the line and you either shift over or you don't, but there's this line between uh, those embracing the, the crypto world, like everyone on this panel and those who've studied it, but still hang on to the traditional roots. So how are you seeing like that entry point, that beachhead of customer perspectives and, and how are the traditional investors seeing it? Uh, I think the traditional uh, investors are, are getting the message, especially uh, because Holt, um, in partnership with the Holden uh, family office with a you know 25 year track record of amazing returns. So a lot of the investment community know the Holden products, know you know the basics, equities, Canadian equities, bond funds. But what it's done is instead of investing a million dollars, they can take that million dollar investment and split it down into you know one dollar tokens uh we're doing uh solid block actually is uh tokenizing the um whole real estate portfolio um right now so just uh the ease of accessibility for people um once it's all done in the background just to be able to yes i'd like to buy you know a hundred dollars worth of narrows tokens or a hundred dollars worth of solid block tokens um so I think it uh, and companies also like Wealthblock, um, which I advised last year, they the one thing for all the companies that come through the accelerator is the um, ease of information and whether it's a complete fact section or learning or 101s or tutorials just to get people sort of over the edge. And if you look at somebody like uh, Wealthblock or SolidBlock, it's basically just point and click off the whole system and uh, it goes right into your bank account and we, we custody, we provide lending, staking, uh, full bank account service, but also um, for the uh, Holt Accelerator companies as they grow, providing them uh, a banking platform, uh, you know, to pay their employees and if they want to pay in crypto or Ethereum, uh, mass payouts and a, a lot of things that come along with that as well. Awesome. Super interesting. And, and by the way, thanks for all the shout outs. I, it's not prompted, so I definitely owe you a beer in person when we're allowed. I don't want to do the whole virtual thing. So let's wait. Let's let's wait till we can see each other. Finally, uh, Emily, I want to shift over to you. A uh, lot of hacks right now in the space. <laughs> I was doing some research on the cybersecurity front and crypto is obviously uh, heavily up there. Some of this stuff, like, you know, speaking with others, like, Hack sometimes it's around just the basic database that's just like we've opened up some back doors and made it happen. And then in crypto, it can even be even more challenging to prevent, prevent that stuff, right? So uh, maybe talk, I mean, that's where you specialize and spend your time in it too. So talk me through the DeFi space, talk me through the type of hacks and how can we start preventing this? Yeah, 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 for sure. And also you were mentioning that 45% of hacks were in the DeFi space and it's true and the hacks are, are huge. And basically the problem is that so um, those vulnerabilities, they're there for everyone to see. It's basically a bug bounty uh, with millions or billions of dollars where you're basically saying, all right, hackers, try to get me. <laughs> and the thing is, so you have some, you know, some providers that specialize in, you know, recovering the funds afterwards, etc. what you mentioned. But what we try to do is to prevent that. And so typically uh, they are kind of the usual vulnerabilities that we try to look at, but also uh, typically the efficiencies of the system is really what we try to do. Um, because, you know, typically on the DeFi ecosystem right now, uh, you can lose a lot of money in terms of a transaction fees as well, right? So this is also something that can siphon your project. So, um, yeah, and it's right now, it's a pretty good time to be smart contract auditors. Uh, <laughs> so the problem would be uh, actually the, the opposite, right? It's um, that there are not enough uh, skilled people who are able to do that. Um, and it's really uh, coming back to what Ethan was saying that I, I also subscribe that at some point, uh, I think blockchain is going to become a black box, right? You're just going to know, okay, I do this and then I get this advantage, the money sent that way or this way, or I do an investment and I get the benefit. And definitely, I think we're, we're going to need people who are going to audit those systems so that people can trust it. Because it's, it's unreal to think that we're going to get in a world where everybody understands the code behind cryptocurrencies and blockchain. It's completely unreal. And definitely, I think we're going to need more and more people like, you know, the engineers who work at chain security to, to secure this whole ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. Great thoughts. I want to shift over to another area that we, we quickly touched on in our, our prep call there. Uh, the idea around building communities and reward incentives, like it's a very interesting space. There's a lot you could potentially do there, leveraging blockchain te technology, but maybe also in a, in a broader scheme, how that could relate to current monetary policy or CBDCs. So what's your thoughts there? 
Yeah, definitely. Well, I think what we saw, and, and to me, the, the amazing thing about cryptocurrencies is they're basically a monetary experiment. They're like a, a laboratory for, for you know, monetary experiments. And what we saw with Bitcoin and with other cryptos is that you can use monetary creation to reward, to reward an activity that is beneficial to the community, typically here, securing the network, right? Um, and this is something that potentially, as we're going to move to CBDCs and to, to smart money, we're going to be able to create smart money for governments as well. Maybe, you know, monetary policies can become kind of smarter and also try to reward activities that are judged beneficial for society. And maybe, you know, it could be organized in a way that is a little more decentralized and that wouldn't go against uh, individual freedom. And so th this is really what, what blockchain and, you know, what these decentralized communities offer. And to me, that's what's very, very exciting about the technology. Awesome. That is definitely some very profound things to, to consider right now. And I so appreciate that. Uh, I, so maybe we can start shifting over. I, I do want to get Kinsleam up here uh, just for the sake of time. Uh, we have Austin. So I'll get you to pop on the screen and I'll get you to start sharing your screen as he's there. He is great to see you uh, as he's coming on there. Uh, I'll just read re uh, some of the last questions. I didn't, I forgot to talk about the last poll. Uh, and what we saw was, well, 67% of them actually were super excited about blockchain. So it felt great that this felt that this next panel was about that. Uh, next hot areas uh, were on the tech side for for on the finance on the wealth tech side. 27% really believe in AI ML. So those were the couple two areas. All right, let's uh, Austin. Look, you look like you're ready to go. So I'm going to flip it to you and yeah, let's hear the pitch. Excellent. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everyone. Make sure my screen's working here. Okay, cool. So Consilium was started in 2017 with three co-founders coming from backgrounds in big data, machine learning, and proprietary trading. We originally set out to build the Bloomberg for digital assets, but have since expanded to trade execution and even strategy development. The digital asset markets present a number of challenges for traders. In contrast to equities, there are hundreds of exchanges and trading venues around the globe where digital assets are traded. These markets are very fragmented, both in terms of information and liquidity. Crypto markets are notorious for high volatility and instability, resulting in frequent outlier events. These are 24 seven markets with most exchanges operating using third party software running in the cloud. Outages, connection issues and unstable APIs are still common today. Even Coinbase crashes when prices spike. And finally, the growing institutionalization of crypto brings more competition for traders and ultimately leads to a technology arms race in the markets. Our main activities can be broken down into three components. The first is to aggregate and analyze digital asset data at a global scale. Without quality information, nothing else works. The second is to leverage the scale and granularity of this data to train machine learning models to learn patterns of market behavior. And finally, these models are used to power trading technology and strategies across different exchanges, assets, and timescales. Just to give you a brief idea of the scale that we're dealing with, Consilium captures and analyzes more transactions per month than the London, Toronto, and Hong Kong stock exchanges all combined. That's over a billion trades per month. Keep in mind, this is being done on a global scale. These are just a few examples of the over 60 exchanges that we cover. And all of this is happening in real time right now. These data pipelines power our core products designed to help funds find alpha and execute large orders in times of thin liquidity. For instant execution, Consilium has developed a liquidity routing system that connects to eight different exchanges as well as two OTC desks. It allows for large trades to be broken down intelligently across exchanges in order to achieve a better price when trading large sums of capital. We charge our clients a percentage of this price improvement. We don't get paid unless they save money on the trade. If anyone in the audience is managing a crypto hedge fund or looking to make allocations to crypto hedge funds, we'd love to speak with you. Thanks. Awesome. Super cool stuff. Really, really great pitch. There's been some changes to that that I really like to see that comparison of the volume is really interesting. Uh, flip it over uh, to our, our panelists, esteemed panelists. Feel free to add a comment from what you see in the space. And then with a question, try to keep it to about 30 seconds so we can get in a couple more of these. And Austin, try to keep your answer to about a minute. Uh, mine would be kind of uh, just a quick question. So um, how do you access the, the information from the exchanges? Do you need some sort of deal or is that open information that you can access freely? 
At the moment, most of it is open. So I, we can see that probably shifting over the next few years as you see traditional exchanges and traditional equity exchanges make a lot of their money on those data feeds. But right now there's still so much competition between the different trading venues that they've offered these, these data feeds through open APIs. Ethan or Scott? I'm trying to find a question because it was such a good pitch. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to ask. He he touched on all the great points. Uh, I love the fact that you're 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 taking um, your commission off of the 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 savings there, the economy that's that's created. I, I think that's a really smart uh, way to position this. Um, you know, the fact that you're you're highlighting that you're good for funds, OTC, and for miners. Uh, there's just so much. It, it's obvious this has been um, well thought through and and well practiced and pitched. I I I should have a question, but I don't. Uh, wow. Awesome. That's okay. uh, that is probably one of the highest forms of compliments we can get. We're stump stumping Ethan. And I can tell you, he's, he's, he has a, he's a wealth <laughs> of ideas whenever I speak to him. So uh, fantastic. Uh, let's shift over that. Uh, Scott, do you have any other points there? Uh, yeah, we're working with Concilium. So I'm um, uh, very in depth with the story, but it's uh, the technology and just where they've come is, is amazing. Um, I would ask maybe Austin, what do you see the biggest, um, requests coming in for clients uh, when you're speaking to whether it's the hedge funds or the exchanges or anybody, um, what are people asking for, um, whether it be DeFi or, you know, things like that? DeFi is definitely one of the bigger ones that come up and we, we don't have that integrated at the moment, but the second biggest request would probably be around net settlement venues. So one thing that crypto is really doing pretty poorly at the moment is handling the collateralization across different exchanges. So you could be long Bitcoin on exchange one and you could be short Bitcoin on exchange two and you could get liquidated in both places. Those exchanges have no ways to talk to each other and really recognize that. Um, so nobody wants to have their money parked on these exchanges for too long, probably for reasons that Emily could explain really well. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that would be probably the, the biggest thing that we see from our side is OTC desks and net settlement venues that can actually give you credit. Great. Thanks. Awesome. Jen, All right. Well, thank you. Don't mind. I actually have a quick question for Emily, if I can just turn the, turn the tables here. Is that all right? Let's, let's, let's do it. Why not? Let's flip it around. All right. So <laughs> uh, I think it was yesterday or about two days ago, almost $60 million was stolen from a, a project called Uranium Finance. And it was literally because one of the developers didn't put a zero. There was one zero missing in the entire smart contract. How do you guys find those little errors and how do you help companies avoid these huge mistakes? Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a really great question. So basically what we do, so we, we are kind of proud that we think we're one of the most thorough auditors out there. So the way we proceed is first we have, you know, so obviously we have software, right, to try to detect, uh, you know, the common mistakes, etc. But then we also have two auditors running manually through the code to really analyze it. Um, and so, yeah, it's really, we try to mix the automated aspect and the manual aspect in the thorough review. Um, and then we, you know, we organize at the end of each audit, like the whole team gets together and looks through the code kind of quickly and the two auditors present to the rest of the team and then they look all together. So that really helps to, to be as thorough as, uh, as possible. Yeah. But definitely, awesome. I mean, the, the people, the developers who develop smart contracts, they're, they're human, right? And so this is kind of, we keep talking about how we're going to automate everything and the trust is in the technology, but the technology is still created by humans. And, you know, what, what you explained kind of reminds you of that for sure. Great. Yeah, I mean, one missing zero, $60 million out the door. I think you have a, a lot of problems to solve. One of the important things to remember, too, when people are thinking about um, hacking and crypto is, is uh, lest it, it cast a shadow on all the amazingness that's going on in crypto, the important thing here to understand is this is less about hacking, per se, as it is just poor developers. Uh, if you've ever done any project working in, in, with, with developers, you know there are good ones and there are bad <laughs> ones. Uh, or pe there are people who are more skilled at coding and less skilled at coding. And the problem we have is there are, there are some people who are maybe not the best developers in the world writing smart contracts for DeFi protocols. And of course, there's going to be mistakes. So uh, I don't, yes, that's, there isn't a, people are taking advantage of that. I, I, I hesitate to call that exactly hacking because they're not breaking we something. We generally call it exploits. Already. Yeah. See, they're exploiting something that's already yeah. there. 
And so the important thing to also remember is we're at the early stages of all of this, especially in DeFi, as this iterates, those contracts are going to become bulletproof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's true. I, I can't I can agree. If I may just add, you know, um, it, you could make the comparison if you make a legal contract and it's a very bad lawyer that makes the contract and, you know, he forgets all sorts of cases. And then potentially, you know, if he goes to court with a much better lawyer, the other lawyer is going to exploit the weaknesses of the contract. So it's kind of the same idea. Yeah, in the legal world, even one word can change the interpretation and then leave it open to be able to get exploited versus this. So a zero versus a word, right? So, okay, and I'll do there. Austin, thank you for the time. Uh, we'll have to cut it there because I also wanna be cognizant of time. Although Rhonda just left yeah. a comment in the chat about smart contracts. Um, yeah, that being smart. Um, I actually would go even further. Smart contracts are neither smart nor contracts. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so as we're shifting off, I do want to do a couple more things. I'm going to launch one poll that is a more fun poll for the audience because, hey, we have a sophisticated audience in there. And then I'm going to go uh, as you guys are all getting uh, the, the poll, even the panel is able to uh, respond to that. So it's going to it's going to be what is the price of Bitcoin? So there's various ranges to be able to look at. I'm going to rapid fire questions while the audience is doing this and filling it in to everyone. Let's go around the room. What like what do you think the price of Bitcoin is at the start of 2022? People say it's going to peak at the end of 2021. It's going to peak and then, you know, and then. <laughs> What's that peak? Can you can you give us some flavor of what you think that peak is? Uh, no, I'm not good at predicting the future. <laughs> uh, it's a cop -out. At least you gave us some some insights. Uh, Scott <laughs> or Ethan, or at least give us some, some numbers here. I'll say six figures. Six figures. I think we're seeing so much corporate adoption that I think we, for the, you know, we're, we're so far into 2021 already that by the time corporates maybe get tired of this, it's going to be 2022 and that's going to push this over six figures. Six figures. Uh, quick question. Is there an, EF, an NFT bubble right now? <laughs> we're not just in a bubble. We're in the trash can. There is so much garbage um, <laughs> uh, going on at NFTs. Uh, the, the thing is, is this is like ICOs with crypto. Uh, there's always going to be crypto grifters and garbage out there. Uh, NFTs are going to be the future of finance in lots of ways because I believe tokenized securities are the future of finance and NFTs are one of the ways that we're enabling that. So uh, that's amazing. It doesn't mean that people aren't selling crap. Ellen just tried to do an NFT of a stick cat that she drew on a piece of paper and Luckily, only five of the 10 sold and they were for $2,500 a piece. But oh. it shows that even celebrity doesn't, doesn't make, make this thing work. But on the flip side, there's also a lot of celebrity pushing absolute garbage. Um, that's unfortunate. I, I, some of these platforms are going to fail. Does your money go with it? Is the NFT worthless? Some of these smart contracts for the NFTs are de definitively not smart and definitively not contracts. And, <laughs> and so I think that there's, we're going to see problems, but NFTs are here to stay because of what they can do with different assets, but we are definitely bubbly. Yeah, I echo that. And I think we've seen that before at the ICOs, 90% scams. Realistically, the top 1% are going to survive. And we're probably going to see that probably equating to the NFT world. So there's going to be a shakeout. And there are good reasons why it does apply. And there's a bunch of reasons why it doesn't. Uh, I just, lastly, I'll just uh, read the poll answers here. Then we say that uh, of it, 55% of the audience thinking it's between 50 to $100,000 price of Bitcoin, uh, 42%, 100 to 200. 8%, 200 plus. So those are probably the hardcore hodlers at this point, really trying to amp it up. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so, and then we also ran another one directly right away. What year does CBDC go live in any country? 2021, 58%. I mean, arguably Project Sand Dollar, as, as you alluded to, Ethan was already technically live. So does it already count? All right. So we're maybe we're already there, but others like maybe others didn't kind of, kind of consider that. I tried to the... click 2020, but it wasn't there. Um... <laughs> You're, yeah. Yeah. I got to update the polls accordingly. It's not my fault there, but great to have everyone. Positive energy, a lot of really cool stuff, super opportunistic about the future in a lot of cool ways, even though we'll work through some of these, these, the challenges that we do face, but we have good auditors on the route, our route just to solve a lot of these issues. So thank you to our panelists and everyone for the time today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Congrats, everyone. Austin. <laughs>